We welcome Kevin tonight all the way from Buffalo, New York. Kevin's an Agile coach, trainer, and practitioner with over 15 years experience using Agile and Lean. Um, he's worked from varying from small startups to large multinational firms, founded Gem Software to help organizations improve what matters um, and create better ad outcomes. And with our flow metrics, this is right in line with that. So Kevin, it's all yours. Take it away. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Trish, and thanks everyone for joining us and for Thank having you. me here. Um, so like Trish mentioned, I am going to talk today about some flow metrics and how to use them for uh, forecasting and to improve your predictability. And I've only got 15 minutes, so I'm going to get right into it. Um, so we're going to start with a quick introduction to forecasting, and then we're going to introduce um, sort of all of the flow metrics sort of a little bit more formally. And then we'll talk a little bit about how you can use those flow metrics to improve your predictability and, and possibly improve conversations with your customers as well and, and your stakeholders. Um, so one of the most difficult questions that teams are asked is when will it be done? Um, this, is, this can be frustrating for teams. Um, they, they often have, have trouble answering this. They, there's a lot of stress that goes along with answering it. Um, and, and it just frustrates teams, right? And, and there's good reasons that we have to answer this question. Um, we got to create marketing plans. We've got to create uh, different types of projections. If you're at a startup, you've got to um, figure out how, how much runway you have left. Um, there's all kinds of really good good reasons that we need to answer the question when will it be done. Um, but so so we have to create a useful answer to this question. So historically, this has been done by uh, by doing estimations, right? By spending a lot of time sitting down and talking about how big a thing is. Um, teams add a fudge factor, et cetera. They, they try to just inspect the problem uh, closely enough that they understand it well enough and can create an estimate. Unfortunately, they often get it wrong and then they just get this bigger magnifying glass out and they try to inspect it even closer the next time. Um, so with all of this uncertainty, how can we account for all of that and still be able to answer that question of when will it be done? And that's where forecasting comes in. So um, humans are really good at forecasting because we've had to be, right? The, uh, hurricanes, for example, are one of the most damaging natural phenomena. And we've gotten really good at forecasting this, even in the face of all of the uncertainty that meteorologists deal with. Um, I'm not a meteorologist, so I don't know what all that uncertainty is, but I, I imagine there's lots of it. Um, so the forecast looks something like this. Um, the first thing that I'm going to point out here is that there's this cone, right? And that cone is describing uh, the probable path of the storm. There's some, some kind of a disclaimer similar to this on every, uh, every forecast that you see like this that says the, the path will likely be inside of that cone. And if you look a little bit closer, what they're actually saying is that 60 to, there's a 60 to 70% chance that the center of the storm is gonna be inside of that cone. Um, it's not 100% because nothing can be 100% in, in, in this world, right? The, this complex world, we can't determine things with 100% probability. Um, so we create this, this forecast that has some kind of a, uh, so, some range. So they build that forecast doing something like this. They, they uh, simulate the track of the hurricane um, and create a bunch of lines of where the hurricane might end up. Each of those lines is a possible path of the hurricane based on the simulations. And then they, they draw that cone based on where 60 to 70% of the translations are. Um, the next thing that they do is they update the forecast frequently. Um, so the, the forecast is updated every six hours uh, as, it, as it comes close to land, and then it's updated every three hours as we get even closer. So these forecasts are, are run constantly to try and figure out you know, what, what changed, what, what is different based on what we know now compared to what it was previously. So uh, let's see, why is it not going? All right. So how can we take those practices and apply them to knowledge work, right? They, these are all of the forecasting practices. Um, so the original question that we asked was, when will it be done? Uh, it can mean two different things, right? There's either one thing or multiple things. We can be asking, when is this one card going to be done? Or when is this one epic going to be done? Or when is this one thing gonna, going to be done? Or we can ask about multiple things. When are we going to have this bucket of stories done? When are we going to have this bucket of features done? And each of them requires a different kind of forecast. So the first, if we're trying to forecast a single thing, we can use something like this. This is a cycle time scatter plot. On a cycle time scatter plot, what we're tracking is cycle time along the, the vertical axis. 
and the date that something finished along the horizontal axis. Um, what we can do if we have a cycle time scatter plot is we can draw this line. At, in this case, it's the 85% line that says 85% of our cards are above that or, or are below that line, and 15% are above the line. That 85% line can say can help us create a forecast for a single thing. If someone asks us when is something going to be done, when is the next thing you start going to be done, we can say with 85% confidence we're going to have it done in 16 days based on our historical data. Um, similarly, for multiple things, we, we can create a forecast as well. And this forecast uh, is a little bit more complicated. Um, we have to have a guess of how many things there are, right? How many things do we need to get done to be able to say that we're done with this? And a set of historical throughput samples, uh, throughput just being the number of things we get done in some time period. Um, once we have those throughput samples, we can do something like this. This is a simulated burndown, very similar to the simulated hurricane paths. And we can draw a line here that says 85% of, of these burn downs finish before that line. And based on that line, we can say we will be done with this, this bucket of work by this date with 85% confidence. Uh, once again, we're simulating that and, and, and figuring out what, what it might look like. This is called a Mon Monte Carlo simulation, if you want to look into it in a little bit more detail. Um, there are some spreadsheets that Troy McGinnis has made freely available at focusedobjective.com that will help you to run some of these Monte Carlo forecasts and sort of do a lot of the heavy lifting for you. So I have introduced two of the flow metrics, throughput and cycle time. I'm going to sort of more thoroughly introduce them here. So throughput is the number of work items completed per unit of time, and cycle time is the amount of elapsed time it takes for a given work item to complete, the time from when a piece of work started to when the time the, the, that piece of work finished. There is a third flow metric, and that is WIP, work in progress, the total number of items that are started and haven't been finished yet. Now, these three flow metrics come from something called Little's Law. A lot of you have probably heard of it before. Um, we don't ever want to calculate Little's Law. There's really no reason to do it because it's based on averages. Um, those averages, we, we can't really use to forecast. We can't really use it for anything. But Little's Law describes the relationship between these things. And understanding this relationship is how we're going to become more predictable. So what does that mean? How do we improve predictability? Um, so I'm going to start with WIP. And that might sound a little bit counterintuitive because WIP is the flow metric that we don't use for forecasting. So why are we starting there? Um, but WIP is the one thing that we can control, right? We can explicitly control WIP. In order for something to become work in progress, for it to be started, we have to decide to start it, right? We have to explicitly decide to do that. And if we can control WIP and, and manage it effectively, then we're, we're taking sort of that first step towards predictability. So how do we do that, right? Uh, the obvious way is that we create uh, WIP limits. And hopefully you stick to them, right? If you don't stick to your WIP limits, then they're, they're not very useful anyways. Um, so the WIP limits might look something like this. We've got two things in the first two columns and three things in the third column. Um, the WIP limits also might look like this, right? Obviously, we're violating the WIP limit in the third column. So we, we made this agreement that this is how we're going to act. This is how we're going to work. And then we violated it. We decided we're not going to do that anymore. Now our WIP is varying, right? So if we go back to Little's Law, with that varying, we, can't, we don't know what's going to happen to the cycle time and throughput. Um, now, this is a little bit different, right? In the, in the third column, we changed that WIP limit to six. Now we're under that WIP limit, right? And, and when we call it a limit, it, it feels like it should be an upper limit. But the truth is, if we're far below the limit and we're varying between zero and six, then we're also not controlling WIP. We're also being, there, there's a lot of variance there and it, it can cause issues with your cycle time and your throughput and your predictability ultimately. So I think of these WIP, WIP limits, as, as we normally call them, as WIP targets, right? This is where we want to be. We want to be at six things or at three things or wherever it is that we agreed to. And if we can stay close to those numbers, if we can stay, stay consistent there, then we're, we're working towards predictability. Um, so next, I'm, we're going to talk about cycle time. But I'm going to introduce another metric that's, that's sort of related. Um, this is work item age. And this is, um, for me, the most important thing for, uh, for teams to hear about. Right? This is something that people don't know a whole lot about. It's a little bit hidden. Um, but it, it is incredibly useful. So work item age is the elapsed time since current WIP was started. It's the, when it, it's sort of a leading indicator of cycle time, right? If each of these cars were to finish today, 
then the, the work item age would become the cycle time. So as work item age is increasing, if, if an, an work item is getting older and older and older, then we can expect an older and older cycle time to come eventually. This is the, the sort of key here is that we, we need to manage work item age. So um, some of the ways that we can do that, uh, one thing is when, when we talk about walking the board, when we're at a standup, we talk about walking it from right to left. That's all about work item age. We're trying to find the older things so that we can work on, work on focus on getting those done more quickly and manage the age of that work. Um, now, if you can do something like a work item aging chart similar to this, you can just explicitly pull the oldest things, right? You don't have to use that right to left um, rule of thumb. But either way, when, when work starts getting older, what we have to do is act actively go and, and get it done, actively go and do things to, to try and make it move forward. So that, that might mean removing blockers, that might mean picking up the phone and calling some other team um, that that might mean all kinds of things, all kinds of actually really hard work, right? That's that's the hard thing about what we do is improving the systems that that create these long cycle times. But this is a really good way for us to to identify where they're coming from. So um, I I am just realizing I never sort of walked through what this chart was. So each of the dots on this are representing a card or a group of cards um, that is currently active. The column. Uh, represents the column on your team's board. So it's it's just where is it on the board. And the height of the dot corresponds with how many days it's been since that work item started. Um, the colors here are are related to those cycle time, uh, that cycle time scatter plot. So this 85% line here is going across. And if something breaks that 85% line, it's the same as the 85% uh, uh, cycle time on the cycle time scatter plot. And the interesting thing here is that it sort of steps down as you get to each column. So 85% of work finishes dev done by the time we get here. 85% of work finishes dev active by the time we get here. So we can see based on what column it is, it's in, is this older than most of the other work is by the time it finishes that column. Um, so you can use this during standup. You can use this to when you're talking about, about blockers and about sort of improving organizational structure or things like that. You can say, you know, the, the old things are caused by this reason, right? They're all happening in the dev active stage because X, Y, and Z, whatever that is. Um, and by preventing work items from aging, we can indirectly control cycle time. That's how we start having an impact on cycle time. So we've talked about controlling WIP and we've talked about managing cycle time. Um, if we control WIP and we manage cycle time, then we can be confident that throughput is gonna stay stable uh, the, the, through because of Little's law, right? They're related in that way so that if WIP is stable and cycle time are stable, then throughput has to be stable. Um, there's one other thing here that I'm gonna throw in here, and, and this is that all work must finish. And what, what I mean by that is that any, any item that passes the start point of the system also must eventually pass the finish point of the system. Um, so, so this isn't to say that, that you have to actually finish the work, you have to push it to production if you decide it's no longer valuable. Uh, sometimes the, the market shifts or we've discovered technology issues that make it, it impossible to do or, or harder than we thought it was going to be to do. We shouldn't waste time actually working on it, but we can't just pretend that it didn't exist either because if, if we do, then we don't preserve the throughput aspect of this and we can't trust that our throughput is actually going to stay stable. So all work must finish. We have to actually mark that work as finished. And when you mark it as finished, when you move it into that done state so that it sort of counts towards your throughput and all of that fun stuff, um, you should also mark it and say, you know, this was something that we decided not to do. This was waste in some way. Um, so we can start to understand why do we start those things that we, we later decide that we're not gonna finish. Um, so this is sort of the, the hidden thing that is required for us to be able to trust the stability of the throughput numbers. Um, so, uh, bottom line here, for, uh, for the purposes of improving our predictability, there's two things that we should be doing. We should control our WIP, um, and that means actively control it, right? Stick to the, stick to the rules that, that you guys set for yourself, that the team set for themselves. And, um, and not just say it has to be below some number, right? It has to, we want that target. We want to be shooting for staying stable at, that, at whatever that WIP limit is, or that WIP target is. And you need to manage the age of the work. Uh, so you can do that through an aging chart, or there's all kinds of different ways that you can get insight into the age of the work. 
uh, but we have to manage the age of, of work so that we don't have increasing cycle times. And if we do those two things, then, then we're really pretty far on our way towards improving our predictability. We can start trusting those Monte Carlo forecasts. We can start trusting that those um, the cycle time scatter plots to help us understand, you know, when are we going to be done? What with with what confidence level uh, will we be done by this date? And then you can have really good conversations with your customers, uh, both about, you know, is are we? When do you need this thing by? Like, how, how can we how can we sort of meet your needs? And also. Is this okay? Like, if if eighty five percent of our work is done in thirty days, is that good enough for you, or do we have to do something about our process to make it better to to improve that cycle time? Um, so that's that's the big the big thing. Um, so thank you for listening to me. I think I just barely hit fifteen minutes. Um, you can see more of of this stuff. I write about some of this stuff at improvingflow.com, along with Mike Bowler, and we both have an upcoming training course through Pro Kanban. Uh, that you can find at improvingflow.com slash training. And there's a discount code available, uh, meetup21. You can also find me at gemsoftware.co and on LinkedIn or wherever else. So please connect. I would love to talk about this some more. And hopefully there's some questions and answers coming up here. Yeah, Kevin, that was a great flyby introduction to uh, answering that question when we'll be done and using some of the metrics. Whole pile of questions have come through. Some people have posted them publicly in the chat. A few people sent me just private questions as well. Either one is great, folks. If you do have a question, feel free to throw it in the chat. If you'd like to just ask it yourself, uh, just put your hand up or something and uh, and uh, and I'll get on you in a minute. Uh, Kevin, the first question came in here, um, and this was talking about that 85% confidence level. Folks often hear a date and stop listening to, I'm 85% confident about that. They just hear a date. How have you been able to help people understand that, that this is a forecast and not a commitment. Yeah, uh, so I, I, I talk similar to this, right? All, all of that, that sort of early stuff about forecasting that I was talking about was really around trying to help people understand what a forecast is, right? There, there's two aspects of it. There's a, a probability and a range. So that help talking through it uh, from the, the hurricane standpoint or some kind of weather phenomena or something that they're more familiar with, can help them to, to sort of realize what it is that you're saying. But it takes a conversation. You have to have their attention for at least a little bit to have that conversation with them and, uh, and get them to understand that, to see that. The, um, the, the, just speaking about the forecast, there's, it, it's a little bit lower down, but I'm going to jump to it right now. There's a question on that forecast so far that in that animation you showed, it looks like the forecast um, they're showing some degree of certainty for the next 24 hours or something. And then there's, it's sort of fuzzy. It's gray. There was a little white. It didn't do a full, they weren't coloring that into forecast that. Um, and I understand how that, that works for the weather. In many of our corporations, that's not an acceptable answer that I'm going to forecast the next week or I'm going to forecast the next month. I need to forecast, to your point, out multiple months or multiple years because I've got to arrange marketing or sales or customer training or all of these things with it. So how do you maybe deal with the fact that your forecast that you provide your customers and stakeholders next month might be different than the one you provided them this month? Yeah, I, so I think that um, when I've had that, that conversation with stakeholders, they're always far happier than when I have the conversation at the end of the project. And I say, sorry, it's not going to be done. Uh, when, when they're expecting it next month instead of six months down the road, uh, it's a lot easier to say, you know, we're going to have to push it a month. So the, the best way to deal with that is to run those forecasts really frequently, right? Like, just like they do with the weather forecasts. You know, nobody's going to get mad if, uh, if the hurricane goes somewhere else eight hours later, right? You, I don't know, right? I, I'm giving you the best information I have, but I'm going to update it every three hours. I'm going to update it frequently and predictably so that you have the best information that you can. Um, so we take that the, the new historical data into account when we create that new forecast. And, and once again, it's a partnership between you and your customers, right? If you, if you let them know that, you know, I've got 85% confidence that this is where I'm going to be. And next week, I'm going to give you another forecast. And it's, it's probably going to be more accurate because we have better historical data and, and just help them to understand that. Now, you, you were talking to me a little bit earlier today about the fact that you've run this with teams before. And when you first put this forecast in front of them, often they're not happy and they don't believe it because it's so far out. Um, 
how have you been able to work with teams and managers and customers to help them understand that it's based, it, it, it is actually using real data um, as opposed to being a deterministic process of, well, you need to hit this date. It's very much bringing that empiricism that we advocate for in agile ways. I'm just wondering how you've introduced that idea beyond uh, hurricanes. What else have you done? Yeah. When I introduce this to teams, I, I normally will run the forecast on a project that is already finished. So I'll use the six months of data previous or three months of data previous to that project starting, and then I'll forecast that project. And when I walk through it all, I don't tell them that, right? I'm, I'm showing them these examples. I'm showing them what, 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 how we can use the forecast and what, and what it's going to show you. And then I say at the end, you know, this is your project, right? This is the forecast that was created based on your project that you just finished. Um, what do you think about that? Like, how, how do you feel about it? Right. I, I've, I've very rarely run into a case. I, I don't think I've ever run into a case where the forecast has been significantly off when I've done that. Um, and, and that usually helps to, to sort of flip their, flip the switch that, oh, I guess this does work. Great way to introduce the tools. Thanks for that. Um, question about what data you're using to actually do this forecasting. And this is kind of a two-part question. Paul mm -hmm. started it um, and then someone else picked it up uh, in the chat here. Um, but do do are, are you forecasting based at the story level or are you basing it on the task level of like the building the components or building the widgets or are you basing it on the story on the, the delineation here yeah. and Paul correct me if I'm wrong but the delineation Kevin I'm trying to make is story is something that's valuable to an end user to a customer whereas a task is something that I need to do to get to that value are you tracking it at that task level or at that value story level so these forecasts work no matter what level you're talking about, right? They work all the way from epics, from uh, business objectives, whatever whatever you're calling those biggest level of things that you're in your organization, all the way down to the smallest tasks. The trick is using a reference class, using a set of data that matches the thing that you're trying to forecast. So if I'm trying to say, if I'm trying to have a conversation about how many tasks am I going to get done in the next three weeks or six months or whatever it is, then I have to use tasks as the input data. If I'm using, if I'm trying to talk about how many stories I'm going to get done, then I need stories as the input data. So it has to be a, a reference class of data that's similar to the thing that you're trying to forecast. That totally makes sense. Um, how much data do you need in order to get an accurate forecast? Um, usually very little. Um, so uh, there, there are some tools in Troy McGinnis' spreadsheet that will take your throughput data and, and tell you how stable it is. So it does, he does some statistics on it that I don't quite understand because I haven't actually looked at it closely enough, but he'll tell you sort of how stable your data is. But usually with, uh, with maybe a month or two, maybe two months of data, you can be pretty confident that um, you've hit, that your forecasts are pretty good. I think the, the uh, statistical probabilities are that within um, 11 data points, you've, you're, I think, 87% confident to have, have hit the bounds of your data. Right to hit the the largest and the smallest types of things that you're going to see. Um, I don't I don't know those exact numbers, so don't quote me on that. But um, it's something like 11, 11 data points gets you to that sort of eighty seven ish percent confidence. That's really cool. I I think I remember at one point hearing seven data points, but uh, but eleven is 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 not far off of there. Yeah. Um, is, is there like getting all of this data? It, it seems like this would be a pretty laborious task. Um, I mean, many of us are probably using tools like Rally or Jira or version one or, or, or something like that. Are there ways to pull this information easily out of those tools? Yeah. Um, so think about what you're, what you're looking at, right? The data that we're trying to get is, is the number of things done and how long it took for that thing to get done. So you need two dates for each card that's going through, right? You need the started date and the finish date. And if you have those two dates for each card that's going through, you've got all the data you need, right? You can, you can generate all of these charts. You can generate all of this stuff based on just those two data points. Um, there are ways to pull this data out of JIRA. Um, we, you can hit the JIRA APIs and sort of automate pulling some of that data. I think Mike may have been doing some work, Mike Bowler, on, uh, on creating an open source tool that will do that for you. I don't know how far along it is, but uh, maybe we can talk about that for a second in a little bit. Um, so there, there are ways to do that. And then you can just stick it into the, into the Excel sheet or directly into Actionable Agile. Now, Actionable Agile also has a Jira plugin. 
Um, it's I, I thought that it, it's actually pretty cheap, right? It's it's pretty reasonably priced for organizations, and it's really a great plugin that that gives a lot of really good insights into some of these uh, these metrics and and the stability of these metrics. Cool. Going to switch gears just a little bit uh, because you said something when you were talking that a couple of people picked up on. Actually, uh, there's at least three or four people here that talked about um, moving, uh, talking the board from um, left to right. Um, uh, sorry, from right to left, uh, right to left. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm doing it backwards, right to left. And and some people are saying, but that doesn't make sense because that's not the priority. Like, how does priority connect to um, to the age of an item. Yeah, so the, the, um, the, so the, at, at a first glance, right, at, at the, the sort of really simple way to look at this is that if, I, if something else was more important, then I would have started it earlier. So the oldest thing on the board has to be the most important from that perspective. Um, now, obviously, that's not always true, right? Sometimes we discover things that are more important and we need things to flow through the team a little bit more quickly. Um, one of the things that will happen as you work towards improving your predictability by, by managing the age of work is that your cycle times will tend to jump down, to, to bump, to go down further and further and further. And one of the things that I've seen happen with teams is they, they get to a point that they don't have emergencies anymore because their cycle times are in the day range or day or two range. So now we don't have emergencies because everything just goes through, right? It wouldn't go any faster if I treated it like an emergency than it would if I just did it, right? If I just did it through my normal process. Um, so that priority decision really becomes a question of what do I start next when there's room rather than what do I put effort towards that's already started? So it really requires us to have that conversation uh, up front. Very cool. Folks, we're at 6.30, but uh, we're not done with our questions. If you do have to drop off, there is a, a link in the chat window uh, to the feedback form that Trish referenced earlier. If you could take a moment to, to fill that out, that would be great. If you're able to stick around for a couple more minutes, uh, we're going to keep Kevin here for a little bit longer and uh, see if we can we can tackle a couple of these remaining questions. Hopefully, we'll we'll get to all of them. Uh, but if you could fill out that feedback form, I know the organizers of Agile TO would greatly greatly uh, appreciate it. So. Uh, Mike also, by the way, added a comment in, Kevin, he he just was uh, reinforcing your point that 81% uh, accuracy is, uh, or, or gets to the upper and lower bounds um, with 11 data points. So that's, that's beautiful. Um, there was a question as well about how you generated the charts. The, did you do those through actionable analytics or did you do those in Excel? Um, a little bit of both. So I showed a couple of of views from Troy McGinnis's uh, Excel spreadsheets, which are, like I said, they're free, they're awesome. Um, and I showed a couple of things through Actionable Agile, uh, the the tool that it, it's both a plugin to Jira and it can be used standalone. So um, you don't have to be on Jira to use it. And um, the, one, the one thing that Actionable Agile does that the spreadsheets don't do at, at all, as far as I'm aware, is the work item aging chart. And I'm not aware of another tool that builds a work item aging chart. Um, if someone knows of one, I'd love to hear about it and take a look at it uh, because I, I love having options, right? Um, but the the work item aging chart comes from Actionable Agile, uh, primarily because that's the only place I know of to get one. Very cool. You've referenced the idea of 85% certainty now a couple of times. Mm -hmm. Where did you make up that number from? Um, it, it is completely made up. It, it, is a, it is a number that most people are pretty comfortable with. Uh, to say that 85% confidence is okay. Um, but if your, if your system requires more confidence than that, then use a higher number, right? Use 95% or 99% if you need to. Um, the, further, the further up you go, the further out your, your timelines are going to go, right? Because your forecast is going to be later and later and later. Um, and you're likely, more and more likely, to deliver it earlier. So 85% is absolutely completely made up. Don't just use it um, because I said so use whatever number makes sense for your context. How do you know what number is the right one to use? Or if you didn't know, would you just start at, at 85? Like, is, is there a right number? I mean, 85 seems like a, a reasonable number, but if, if I will to, was to pull out my uh, Lean Six Sigma hat, you know, I think, what is it? 65, 95, 97 are the three numbers for one, three, one, two, and three 
sigmas. I'm doing that off the top of my head. So mm -hmm. if someone knows those numbers, they can correct me. But I just noticed that 85 doesn't fit in those. Um, just wondering why, if there's if there's any rationale on that one. Yeah. I, Other than you know, it being a made up number. I, I don't know where where that rationale may have came, come from. Um, I think I first heard it uh, through some of Dan Vicante's uh, stuff um, that he he used 85% and I I haven't had the need to question it, right? It's always been, it's always been good enough for, for my purposes, so. Very cool. You'd mentioned, I just wanted to go back to something you said a moment ago, as well as you were, you were talking about um, that course and that workshop that, that you offered, that discount code for folks who have attended this. If yeah. you're watching this on YouTube, by the way, uh, we'll have to get Noel to edit that out because the, the discount code won't apply because the course will be over. Um, but, but is this course specifically on um, metrics and, and sort of forecasting and answering these questions? Yeah, there's two courses that uh, that we have posted right now. The one, the first is, uh, well, the, the second, I guess, is applying metrics for predictability. And that is all about this topic. That is all of the stuff that I talked about here and uh, doing sort of a deep dive over two days into it. Um, the other course is applying professional Kanban. Um, and that is really around how do you set up a Kanban system uh, that really enables you to start doing some of this predictability stuff. So it's really just around the, the basics of setting, setting up a Kanban system for, for a team or for an organization. So I thought you covered off everything in the last half hour um, in, in this, but you're telling me that there's two days worth of content for this. I'm just having fun with you. Kevin, thank you yeah. so much for your time. Really appreciate the introduction. Really appreciate the opportunity to learn more. Um, we're going to make sure that those links get sent out as well to everyone in that, that discount code if people are interested in learning more. Um, remember, folks, there is that feedback survey. That was that was great. I mean, I could probably sit here and, and like you say, I've got another two days worth of questions. Um, but in full disclosure, I am registered for your course. I don't know if you knew that or not, but uh, I am coming uh, yes. because this is fascinating. This is great stuff. So thanks again for your taking, taking your time. Agile TO folks, thanks for being here. Great seeing you all even though most of you didn't have your cameras on. Great seeing your <laughs> names um, and, uh, and look forward to uh, seeing you hopefully in two weeks for our next, uh, our next quick talk. Remember the feedback form, folks. Have a wonderful, wonderful evening.